Dr. Mike Figaro is here today with us. He is a veterinarian and a surgeon in Northern New Jersey. He's an alumni of the University of Pennsylvania School of Veterinary Medicine. He completed his large animal internship at the University of Guelph in Ontario, Canada. Um, and as a, an, a large animal surgical residency at Purdue University. Dr. Pergaro is currently president of the New Jersey Association of Equine Practitioners and on the advisory board member for the Rutgers University Board for Equine Advancement. He is an alumni representative for the admissions committee at UPenn School of Veterinary Medicine. So today I have Dr. Figaro talking to us about a very timely topic that I think is kind of forefront in everybody's mind, I know it is mine, about economical vet care. So I'm going to go ahead and turn my screen and mute off and turn it over to you, Mike. All right, great. Well, thank you, Dr. Williams, for asking me to do this. And uh, Dr. Williams and I actually uh, did this talk back in 2013, and I've updated things uh, since, but it's always fun to put this together. And uh, the one thing I realized as I was doing it was I, I probably should have changed the title. As I read the title, not knowing what I'm talking about, it makes it seem as if I'm going to show you guys all how to do your own lacerations and treat your own colics and everything. Um, if that's what you're hoping for, you may want to take a little nap because I really am going to discuss a bit more of the economics of veterinary medicine and, and a little bit of the industry and hopefully uh, everybody can get something out of that. Sorry, my computer froze there for a minute. Hmm. All right, well, let me do it that way. Okay, so uh, what we're gonna talk about is we're, I wanna talk a little bit about the evolution uh, and, and the business of veterinary medicine as I've seen it. Uh, I, we're gonna talk a little about the current climate uh, and certainly the pandemic has not helped. And uh, I'm gonna spend a fair bit of time on equine insurance because I do think this is something that everybody uh, even even veterinarians, frankly, need to keep uh, being refreshed on this because it keeps changing, and I'm not sure that I'm completely the expert. Um, and then I'm going to talk about I'm going to give everybody numbers, national numbers that we see here in the U.S. in terms of what fees we're seeing of veterinarians, um, and so that people can. And I'll give a little bit of my own personal numbers, and then I'm going to discuss this idea of financial prioritization. Um, and I'll describe a little bit more what that means, but you know, we all have uh, bills and we all have to decide which bills are we gonna pay, uh, which ones are we going to maybe uh, delay a little bit, which ones we're gonna hold some debt on. And so I think this is a, a, a timely discussion because it, most people don't have quite the discretionary funds that they, they once did. Um, so just some uh, comments about the equine industry as a whole. And, you know, we all are very fortunate, whether we're, uh, you know, a groom to a trainer, to a veterinarian, to a barn owner or an enthusiast, uh, that we all get to share something that we all love, and that's the horse. And, you know, we all do it for different reasons. Uh, veterinarians, it's very unique to hear uh, how a lot of us got into it. Farriers, the same thing. But the one thing that I also think that we share is typically we're really bad business people, and veterinarians are no different to that. Uh, I think I'm about the transition generation where we really uh, didn't do, uh, well, I shouldn't say the transition generation, but it, we certainly uh, did not consider the business very highly. It wasn't necessarily uh, talked about a lot in vet school at the time. And I will say that we're transitioning that because that is a big discussion now. And I'll describe why it's becoming a bigger and bigger discussion among veterinary students um, and in vet schools. Uh, you know, we try to also have professionalism in our industry. Um, unfortunately, as many of you have experienced, that's not a requirement. Um, and, you know, we all have to try to keep it as a professional industry. And that's really important that we all do this, do this as a group. And unfortunately, also, I think for some of you have seen that scruples are not necessarily a prerequisite to be in the equine industry. So um, unfortunately, that's a, those last two are very small minorities, but unfortunately, they do uh, ruin it for some of the rest of us with it. So let me talk a little bit about the evolution as I've seen it with the equine industry. And I, I don't care if we're talking about horses or we're talking about our, our small animal pets that we have. Everything's become more expensive. Um, and uh, it, it used to be a bit more inexpensive to have pets, and it's just not anymore from the feeds to the boarding when we're talking about horses or housing, uh, when we're talking about, say, small animals. Purchase prices of animals from the you know, rescues um, are, are not inexpensive when you're giving donations there to what you see people spending in pre-purchase uh, prices. 
Um, it's, it's amazing to see. And so as a, a horse owner, a farm owner, facility owner, anybody in the industry, you have a slew of vendors that you have to acknowledge and, and work with and have these professional business relationships with. And the veterinarian is no different. I, I put us in that same line as, uh, as a vendor. Now, this is where I'm talking about the prioritization because, um, you know, I, I like to think that I'm very conscientious of what my prices are. Um, and I am sympathetic and empathetic when people have uh, certainly emergencies and things that were unexpected and bills that they didn't expect to have to pay. Uh, on the flip side, I, I've learned more about, and this is more recent for me in the past couple of years, I've seen what some of the show entry fees are uh, at various shows. And when I've seen some of those prices, um, it certainly makes me wonder where uh, individuals' priorities lie in terms of where they want to put their finances to. And, and look, you know, the horses are here for our enjoyment. Um, sometimes it's a source of income. Sometimes it's just enjoyment. And so, you know, we have to all decide what's the priority for us. So we'll keep going. And as Dr. Williams said, if you have questions, send them through the uh, chat function. I think that's what you said, Carrie. And um, we'll try to answer them at the end and I'll keep running through some things. So, and I don't mean to sound like sour grapes at all with this, this is the reality to it all, but as a veterinarian, uh, our costs have increased, okay? Our medications have increased, our supplies, certainly our transportation of the vehicles and, and gas is certainly fluctuating even as we speak. Um, you're finding more and more veterinary practices are uh, less solo practitioners. There's still a fair number of solo practitioners, particularly when we see it in New Jersey here as well. Um, but you're seeing more multi-veterinary practices. So payroll and staff becomes an issue when we start talking about how we have to run our businesses. And we have other things that most of you don't even know that we have to pay for, uh, uh, such as license fees, uh, continuing education that we're, we're required to do. And so all of these things play a role in how we have to then develop our business and make sure that we run it like a business. Um, I'm sure some of the seasoned uh, audience members in the group remember the days when we didn't necessarily have x-ray machines and we did the old, old film technology of x-ray machines. Most equine practitioners now have a digital x-ray machine in their truck. These are not inexpensive. Um, uh, many have ultrasounds. Some of us have uh, endoscopes, whether it's for a stomach or to upper airways or other uh, endoscopies. You know, we all have at least two or three different computers that are either associated with some of these uh, diagnostic tools or, you know, for obviously administrative purposes in the um, in our offices. So I point this out because the technology is never going to change. And I haven't found technology to get cheaper. I find technology continually increases. And when you have technology, that also means things are going to break. So then you have to have IT repair people uh, involved with it. So all of these things uh, play a role when we start looking at how do we run this business. Um, I do think because of the technolo technological improvements we have, that I think we're providing much better services. Um, you know, doing an ultrasound on colics is, I won't say it's completely standard now to do, but I do it much more than I ever did when I first came out in practice. And I think that's a, it's a huge, huge advantage that we're seeing. And the interesting thing is the new grads that are coming out of vet school, they're taught to do that with almost every exam of their colics. So, you know, I think our new grads coming out are much better. They're much more, um, they may not have the experience that I have, but they certainly have uh, technological advances that I didn't, I, I didn't have when I came through. You know, they're taught how to read MRIs. I've had to learn to read MRIs on the fly only because they really weren't around when I went through school. Uh, it wasn't that MRIs weren't around, it just, it wasn't very popular. The other thing that you're finding in veterinary medicine, you're finding multiple practices that do maybe focused or specialized type of medicine. Um, and for instance, when I came out of school in the late 90s, um, you basically had a veterinarian for a farm and they did everything from breeding to lameness to vaccines to emergencies, all the above. Um, and now that doesn't seem to be as commonplace. Pra uh, most farms have multiple veterinarians do different parts of their veterinary services. Um, and, you know, some of that's good, some of that's bad. I, I don't I think it's I think it's just a change that we've seen. Uh, I think the other thing you're seeing now, uh, more people, more veterinary practices are not as eager to provide emergency services because they're doing what I like to call boutique type of veterinary medicine, where they're not offering all the things they're offering just a specialized or subspecialized uh, type of practice. And that may not include emergency services, which is an important part if you own a horse, obviously. 
So what's the reality to all this? All the costs have gone up and the pandemic has not helped the situation. I'd like to say that things have gotten cheaper with it, but I'm sure most of you are all finding everybody else's uh, vendors prices are going up. I know I got my Comcast bill and that looks like that's going up. I know our health insurance for our practice went up um, during this time. So basically in order for veterinary practices, in order for them to sustain in the current climate, we have to start running them like businesses. And I will admit that I probably was a big culprit to not do that in the very beginning. I did it out of emotional decisions. You know, I love the animals just like anybody else. And so, and look, you know, Mrs. Smith, I like your horse. I like you. Let's, uh, you know, we'll work something out here. And, you know, we would barter or we might do free services. And I'm not saying we don't do some of that now, but you have to do less and less of that, especially as the practices build and you have multi-veterinary practices. When it's no longer just me out there, uh, and I have an associate and five employees or four employees. Now I have to be smarter about how I handle these things. And that means I need to make smart business decisions. I have business related expenses that go up and they're constantly changing. You know, I want to encourage my staff to say, stay and enjoy what they do. So we offer them benefits and we actually pay them to have time off. And that, that's unheard of. Um, so these are the changes and transitions that we're having to do as, as veterinarians running businesses. So I'm not going to bore you too much with this. Um, these are some current numbers I took off of the uh, Department of Labor and Statistics. And this is December of 2020 showing the unemployment rate of 10.7. And you can see the graph on the right and uh, where it was just before COVID and when COVID hit, how we had such a huge, huge spike um, in this area. Um, and we're, we're hovering right now at about 6.7%. It was interesting, I pulled out demographically what we're seeing here, and it's interesting that teenagers are the highest unemployment rate. Um, uh, underrepresented individuals such as Hispanic, um, uh, African Americans, uh, certainly higher. I was also intrigued that men and women are almost equally represented, which is, um, that surprises me a little bit, uh, but I'm not, sure, I'm not sure what that means. Now, this is a very, very busy slide, but I, really the only thing I wanted to point out here, just so people had some ideas, what this chart is showing uh, up at the top, it's 2018, 2019 median incomes in the US. And I, I circled where we were, 2019 is on the right. Um, and then uh, just showing you the demographics in terms of age brackets and where people are. Um, I, I actually did think, and this is, uh, I'm sorry, this is 2018, 2019. I think these are gonna be uh, very high for 2020, um, which I couldn't find 2020 numbers on this, which was disappointing me because I, I think that would have been a little bit more important to see. Um, I also, in relation to this from this same chart, I pulled out um, uh, regional distributions in 2019. I think you guys can see my cursor and I wanted to see what the Northeast was. And here we are at 76,000 median income. And I actually thought that uh, inside cities was going to be higher than this, um, but it, it was not. Um, so, you know, what's my point on all this? Why do I even put that in there? Uh, you know, I'm sure everybody who's on the call is aware that horses are not cheap. Um, there's no such thing as a free horse. A free horse only adds uh, more expense to it. And we also then have our own personal debts that probably are unrelated to, to the horses. And I pulled this off of um, Experian, which is a, a credit uh, uh, bureau, and showing that the average American debt's about 90,000. Um, and that's including mortgages, credit cards, student debt, et cetera. And so, you know, this comes into the conversation of how do people borrow? What are their borrowing habits? And everybody has uh, a different philosophy on what is a justifiable borrow for them and what they want to assume a debt versus pay off. Um, it may be for career investment and advancement. It may be for home stability, certainly transportation, children, the current pandemic. It's saying that most people during this time are borrowing more than they ever have. Uh, but then we come into the discussion of luxury items. And with luxury items, um, I, I will say that I throw horses a little bit into the luxury item category. Um, there are certainly uh, horse demographics, I'll rephrase that, people in the horse industry that really require horses in order to generate revenue and, and gain an income. In my world of the show jumper and dressage horses performance practice that I do, many of this is a source of enjoyment um, that they have, and, and it is kind of a luxury item. And I, I put a little bit synonymous with owning a yacht, um, although, a yacht would be cheaper than, than a horse, in all honesty. Um, 
But so I, I just throw that in here because we'll talk a little bit more in the next slide about um, you know habits and, and borrowing habits. I pulled this category out and, and we threw some categories uh, in here in terms of uh, Gen Z, millennials, Gen X. And it's interesting showing the average debt amounts. The Gen Z generation uh, is just under 10,000 in debt. They're the group that struggles the most to make payments. They're the ones that are going to keep um, they may pay nothing each month on their credit card, or they may pay the bare minimum. Millennials don't have the highest debt. They're the highest uh, population of individuals next to the baby boomers. They're the highest uh, population, but they don't have the highest debt. But what's interesting to note in the comments on the side is that since 2015, they've had a 58% increase in their debt load. All right, That's a huge amount. If it stays at that rate, that's going to be very difficult to sustain. Uh, Gen X, which is my generation, we hold the highest debt. Uh, Gen Y is probably also lumped into this category in terms of age. The baby boomers and the silent generation, they're holding less debt. Um, but what's also interesting in those age brackets is we're seeing that they're showing um, trends decreasing at about 7% uh, in terms of their debt loads, which, which is an interesting conversation. I, I'm not going to make any huge statements about it, but uh, it's just interesting to see. Um, so now I want to turn a little bit of this conversation. Again, this is not to sound like sour grapes, but again, to put things in perspective for the individuals to see is that vet, stool, vet students debt. So this is a conversation that we have in our veterinary circles quite a bit. Almost every uh, CE event is talking about our student debt. So the class of 2019 on average had about $183,000 in debt. So in general, they're paying a mortgage when they come out. Um, and it's gonna be basically around 2000 a month, 10 year loan at that rate, that's their total payback. What's interesting, and, and it's a little, I don't wanna say stereotypical, but it's a little bit of a, a categorization of the millennials, you know, they're called the generation of change. And they want change and they want change quite quickly. And, and the reason they want change quite quickly is because uh, they've had nothing but electronic uh, understandings of things between emails to social media to uh, as opposed to my group, which didn't have that. So their idea of change happens very, very quickly. Um, and so they want that. And one of the things that's also playing a role here is, you know, we all have certain debt where we have car payments, mortgages, uh, different debts going along. But there is a certain stigma associated with a student loan debt. And in talking with millennials, I found that um, their student loan debt weighs very heavily on them and they want that, they want that gone and they want that gone very quickly. Um, they don't want to wait 10 years. They don't want to wait 20 years to, to, they want it gone because that's in their head. And I'm not sure that it is or isn't. I, I don't really want to say that because everybody's financial situations their own. Um, but they feel that that's holding them back from owning other items, whether it's buying a house, having other luxury items. Um, and so this is a big impetus um, for what we're seeing in terms of in our equine population of veterinarians. Now, here's a little bit more of a sobering comment to say uh, in terms of our population of equine veterinarians. In 2018, we had less than 5% of the veterinarians that were veterinarians in the U.S. and Canada were equine. Currently, we're down to 1.3, 1 to 1.3. And unfortunately, we have about a 60% rate of attrition, which means after four years of practice, 60% of the equine veterinarians will leave. And that's unfortunate because that's going to drive a lot of our industry, at least in our veterinary world, um, and how we have to try to make in our younger generation that's coming up into this industry, industry be happy and be able to sustain and enjoy what they do. All right, so I'm gonna get away from the comments of the, the numbers there and talk about our animals um, and give you some other type of numbers that maybe you can relate to. So it's the discussion now is how do we value our animals and if we put a, a financial value on them. Um, and, and I relate this a little bit to small animals as well. You know, some of our pets, horses included, um, they're our family members. So in those cases, if a, a disease were to come up, many people will say, well, money's no object. We will pay whatever needs to happen to save my ex-pet. Um, they may not even have that money, but they're willing to spend beyond their means to pay for that. Now, that definitely holds true in small animals. 
Um, I wouldn't say I, I, we certainly have a demographic of, of horse owners that follow that suit, but I wouldn't say that's the, the most common thing that we see. Uh, in most cases, horses are some type of source of enjoyment and kind of a luxury item. So there may be a little bit more of a budget or a limit as to what uh, an individual might cap uh, treatment at from, again, from a veterinary perspective. Um, now, if a horse is a source of income, say as a race horse or breeding horse, then that's a little bit easier to make financial decisions based on what the horse is quote unquote worth. Not in all areas of the United States, but some horses are a commodity and for instance, say a mode of transportation. Um, in most of those cases, the value of the horse may or may not be very high because it may be cheaper to go get another horse. Um, I want to throw some numbers in here, and this is including small animals at the, the um, and these are 2019 numbers. The pet industry is a 90, almost $96,000 billion industry with food and treats being almost at 37 billion, supplies, animals, and over-the-counter medications, just under 20 billion, and then other services, not including veterinary services, at 10 billion. So when you look at that, those are huge, huge numbers. Um, so, you know, one of the things that we see when you run a small business, you see how people spend their money. And I always uh, use the term, you know, how are they spending their discretionary money? Discretionary money being money that they have available that, um, you know, they can use on fun items on things. And some of the things I pulled out were what uh, Americans spend on restaurants per year. Now, I, I'd be very curious to see how these numbers change uh, in 2020, uh, certainly with the way restaurants were. But coffee is a great example here in terms of either coffee products or supplies, et cetera, or coffee shops, what people are spending. Um, and this, again, puts me to the discussion of financial prioritization. Um, the numbers down below here are actually equine specific. The nutrition industry in the equine is a $1.2 billion market. Supplements. Now, I'm sure many of you horse enthusiasts and horse owners, you all go online, you all buy your supplements, and they're great marketing tools. They're like the, the uh, antithesis uh, impulse buy. It's almost like the chewing gum at the, uh, at the grocery store. Um, supplements are great because it captures you. You're online, you're spending that money and my horse needs that. And, and, you know, I have my opinion, personal opinions. I think most people overspend on supplements, but most clients feel that's what they need to be doing. So when you look at supplements at 280 million and then vaccines where this is scientifically proven to help keep the life of your horse, that's only a hundred million dollar, million dollar market. It's, it's just an interesting number to see how money is spent and where the prioritization on the veterinary side goes. And I'm not, again, I, I don't want to come off the of sour grapes with this because, you know, I, I understand that it's uh, money that you may or may not have anticipated spending uh, in terms of veterinary expenses. But that's what I'd like to encourage people to think about is that you may have to start budgeting differently and start thinking about how we're going to spend with the veterinarian as the years go on. Very busy slide. There will be an exam on this later on. Um, this is uh, this is basically 400 small animal veterinary hospitals were surveyed, and the the legend on the right is showing you uh, the different services being provided in those uh, small animal hospitals. And what it's showing you is a percent change from 2019 to 2020. And the big blue bars that you see going up, where it's going up almost over 160,000 percent increase, 160,000 percent increase. That's actually the wellness uh, plans that small animal hospitals were selling. I think those numbers are reflective of what we saw, you know, during COVID, many, many people adopted, bought animals, um, and all the shelters emptied out because people took in pets. And I think these were the wellness plans. I'm sure any of you who tried getting your pet into a small animal hospital during COVID now has found these practices to be busy as all get out. And they have, the small animal hospitals cannot move any faster. They are, they are booming. Now where they lost money this year was in grooming, boarding, and interesting dietary products that they sell, uh, which I found interesting. It does not, doesn't surprise me. Now, when we remove these large bars, either in the positive or negatives and the month of April, which was all in the negative, and just show you a little bit more up close, I just want to show you the green bars here, which are surgery. So you can see Again, these are percentage increases from 2019 to 2020. So in the month of July, small animal hospitals were 36 to 37% increase in revenue on surgeries alone. 
Now you can't tell me all these animals were having emergency surgeries. Some of these are probably elective surgeries, um, surgeries people put off. And I'm not, I'm not judging. I'm not criticizing. I'm just saying this is where people felt uh, it was appropriate to be spending their money. My question is, did they have that money or are they spending money that they don't actually have and going into debt on that? And, and that's a decision everybody has to decide what they want to do and how they want to handle that. And for their small animal pets, which are family members, that may be as understandable. I will tell you that equine practices did not see these numbers at all. And if anything, I know with my own personal practice, I found that when the sport industry kind of slowed down, the shows stopped, that people curtailed their spending. Uh, we did a lot less joint injections and, and performance type practice, and we did much more general practice. Um, and so uh, that went along with decreasing, you know, luxury spending uh, in their animals. Okay, you can see my segues are, are not very smooth here. We're going to now delve into the whole concept of equine insurance and equine insurance. Um, most of us veterinarians advocate for it because, you know, we're trained as veterinarians to, we want to do the ideal diagnostics and therapeutics when we see uh, the pets uh, and specifically our horses. Unfortunately, we're usually curtailed by not being able to do that because of financial reasons. Now, having equine insurance sometimes can allow people to go and do more diagnostics, certainly treatments um, that they might not have been able to do financially on their own. Um, I, I, these changes happen quite a bit on an annual basis in terms of how the equine insurance companies are going. So I want to point out some of the key points for you to look into if you haven't done this before. And this is very, very different than small animal insurance. So I, I'm not going to talk about that at all. Um, now, I have some horse owners that don't see the value in equine insurance. They can self-insure themselves and they're going to put the money up or they've decided that their horse is not worth a certain uh, their horse is worth up to a certain amount. All right, so let's discuss equine insurance as a whole. So a true equine insurance policy, um, what you're purchasing is a mortality plan. A mortality plan basically covers death, euthanasia, and theft. And it's based upon uh, a rate that the insurance company deems and that the value of the animal is based upon their age, use, and breed in that prioritization. And so the chart on the right is showing you that a policy, a mortality policy for a dressage horse would probably be around 3% of their value, all right? Now you can buy a mortality policy for any value horse you want. The, the minimum that I'm understanding is about $200. If you just have mortality on your horse, and I didn't know this, um, I have to acknowledge um, Cindy Anderson, who's with Blue Bridal Equine Insurance in Pittstown. She helped me on getting some of these numbers together for me. And she's my go-to uh, for insurance questions. She told me that if you just have a mortality plan that uh, they automatically have, most of the policies have up to $5,000 in emergency colic surgery coverage built into that. Now that's probably only what's covered in the OR, which is a lot less than what things are quoted. And I'll talk about that later. Uh, so they, everybody understands the terminology. There are insurance brokers. Uh, the example I gave of Blue Bridal, they are the sales piece person for multiple insurance plans. There's an insurance carrier, one of the more common ones here in the Northeast that we see as Great American. And then there are, I mean, there are many, many other ones out there. I'm not, I'm not giving you a, a, a certainly a detailed list. There are other contract companies you'll find. And the one that I've experienced over the past couple of years that's new is a company called RJ Ketch. Uh, they happen to be an insurance broker as well, but where I've experienced them is when a client puts in a claim on their insurance policy, they're an administrative company to handle that claim and process the claim. And that's been my experience with it. So now you own the mortality plan and then you can add on to the mortality plan. And this is where we get into the major medical. Uh, medical assistant is similar to major medical, it's just the percentage is gonna be a little bit lower. There's a colic only coverage, which is both gonna cover uh, colic surgery and medical colic. There's a surgical only coverage. And what I'm going to caveat on that and being a surgeon, this is important to say, this is only going to cover what happens in the OR. It's not going to cover the pre and post-operative care. For instance, our colic surgeries. In the Northeast here, we're quoting between 10 and 14,000 for a colic surgery. Um, I will tell you that what happens in the OR for that is probably... I, and I don't have an exact number, but it's probably going to be less than 7,000 is going to what happens, what happens in the OR. The rest of it is going to be outside 
uh, either pre or post. There are other plans like loss of use uh, and other ones that uh, involve reproductive, um, but the most common ones you're seeing are probably the four top ones. And, and the um, chart on the right is just showing you coverage amounts, different policies and what you're looking at premium wise. And I, what I wanna comment for you on that is, let's say the highest one we have here for, it's a coverage of 15,000 is only $775 per year. Now, some people have had frustrations because they think of equine insurance like it's human insurance. Um, it's not at all like human insurance, don't think of it that way. And you also need to remember that from human insurance, between the employer and employee of, of most insurance plans, health insurance plans, they're paying up to fifteen to twenty thousand dollars a year for you to have health coverage. Um, you're not paying those types of premiums at all. So um, I usually tell clients that when they put a claim in, they're going to have to anticipate there's going to be out-of-pocket expenses. The, the insurance company is not paying for all of it. It is usually a shared responsibility. It's supposed to kind of defray from some of the pain from you, but uh, it, it's not to just pay for all of it. Some policies do better than others, and certain diseases uh, allow for the client or the, the policyholder to get more paid out. Uh, in general, for the major medical policies, um, the horse has to be valued at a certain minimum. It's usually around 15,000, but each company is a little bit different here. And it has nothing to do with appraisal value. This is uh, age, uh, breed, and, and occupation. There will be a deductible, usually 500 that you have to pay. And then usually most of the companies have a copay, 80, 20, 70, 30. The other thing, and I have found this, and I'm sure Lindsay's had the same experience where you have cap sublimits. And the most common one that I have found it is in the lameness avenue. So let's say the horse is covered up to 15,000 in major medical, but the cap is you're only allowed to spend, and I'm using this as an example, $7,000 towards diagnostic and 7,000 towards treatment. All right, and you can put it to 5,000, 7,000. I will tell you that when you start getting up into diagnostics like MRIs and CTs or even surgical aspects, um, this is where, um, you will exhaust those numbers. So they only pay up to a certain amount and then it's expected that the policyholder pays the rest of that. With renewals, um, this is something that's kind of changed over the years and the years past. I openly told uh, clients, you know, look, if it wasn't a problem and you didn't put a claim in, don't mention to the insurance companies, that is not the case anymore. You need to report anything because every year when there's a renewal, I as the veterinarian get a renewal report as does the owner and they ask, has the horse had any lameness this year? Has the horse had any radiographs done this year or x-rays done this year? Has he had any diseases or blood work? And if you don't provide any of that information and they subpoena the records, the medical records, you will lose the insurance and more importantly, probably get brought up on, on uh, tax fraud. I'm sorry, not tax fraud, uh, insurance fraud. Pre-existing conditions will get excluded. And if you put a claim in, in most claims, you will probably get excluded for that for at least a year, if not longer. Uh, I don't think I said this, but uh, there are age limitations. Uh, horses, usually it's at 18 to 20 years of age, depending uh, on the policy where they cut it off. So you're, you're very rarely gonna get insurance for a horse uh, over 20. So what's covered on the major medical versus not? And I'm not, you guys can read this and this, you guys can go back to this um, recording so you can see it, but non-elective surgeries are pretty much covered, but like castrations, cosmetic type surgeries are not going to be. Uh, diagnostics for the most part are covered as long as you don't hit the cap limit. But the one challenge I have found is if the diagnosis from the if the, the, the conclusive diagnosis from whatever we've done is arthritis, I have had several clients not have the insurance company pay for any of it. In other words, we've done a lameness exam, we've done blocks, we've done x-rays, we've done an MRI, and the diagnosis was the horse has arthritis in X joint. The insurance company has said, well, okay, arthritis is a, is a written in exclusion in all policies. If there's arthritis in there, we will not pay for any of those diagnostics uh, that were done. I disagree with that 100%. I think that's, I don't think that's in good form by the insurance companies personally to do that after the fact, because at this point they've already spent the money, um, but that's what's in their policies. Um, the insurance companies do treat for ulcers and most infections uh, that are going on. Some of the regenerative therapies like IRAP stem cells are covered, but routine things like uh, farm calls, um, joint injections, vaccines are typically not as You'll also find acupuncture, chiropractic, magna waves, all those type of things, laser therapies are not covered. 
Now there's some additional plans and I call them plans and air quotes there because um, they're really not an insurance plan. The ASPCA has a plan. I've had one client use it. Uh, they didn't particularly care for it. And there were two policies you could purchase. One was a colic plus accidents plan. The other one was a colic accidents and illness plan. And then you could add additions to it. And the addition you could add to it was a preventative or wellness plan like they do in small animals where they would pay for your vaccines, um, dental care if it was performed by your routine dental care if it was performed by your veterinarian. Um, so people should look into that um, if that's something you're interested in. Uh, I, I wasn't overly impressed, but I, I again, I only had one client there and it, I think it was, I was expecting a, an, an equine insurance plan and that's not quite what this is. Uh, it's a little bit different. The other thing is some of the supplement companies have some supplemental plans for lack of a better term, Smart Pack, Platinum and uh, Arenas, which has a product called AssureGuard Gold. They have up to, um, if you enroll your horse and you, you're feeding their product, obviously, um, they will cover up to anywhere from eight to $10,000 in colic surgery coverage um, for the horse. And it's usually the lifetime of the horse. So let's say you only use 5,000 for this colic surgery. If you have to go for another colic surgery, which you know, hopefully you don't have to do a second one, you still have another 5,000 to uh, use with that. Um, now, I, I you have to look into a little bit more. Arenas actually covers medical colic. Platinum has two different layers, an 8,000 or a 10,000. And um, some of them, and it was a little bit questionable when I looked into this, some of them said that they covered the pre and post-operative care while at the surgical facility. And then I saw one that I questioned whether they did that. They're not going to cover any treatments or diagnostics done out in the field by the ambulatory veterinarian. They, they won't cover that. Um, again, the horse has to be um, enrolled in it. There's uh, no age requirement. That's really important. The horse can be 30 years old and, and use this. Um, and you obviously have to keep the horse on the product. Some of them require that if you have another equine insurance plan, you have to use that first, just so you know. Okay, so again, segue that's terribly done here. The numbers, let's go into the actual numbers. So what I did here, some of this is reflective of, of my practice. Some of it is, um, so, so you know, as a veterinarian, there's no place I can go to look and see, okay, what's the, um, what should I charge for, you know, uh, an EWT vaccine? Uh, that's called collusion and there's a lot of laws against that. So we don't do that. Um, so every practice is gonna have a different ones, but there have been some surveys done showing high and low estimates around the United States and Canada as to what veterinary practices are charging. And that's why I put in this box here off to the right just to give you an idea of what you're gonna spend. Now, if you own a horse, you kind of know that, but I think in terms of the discussion of budgeting, you actually should actually sit down and write these down and see these on paper, because I think it helps a lot more to visually see these. Um, Coggins test, which usually is what, once a year that people are doing, health certificates, depending on your, your um, shipping type of uh, program and insurance exams. And, and obviously these are huge variabilities, you know, from the survey that I pulled it from. Uh, often people will ask when they're shopping around for vet practices, okay, well, how about a hawk injection? Uh, what, what's that go for with your practice? And, and again, here's national averages um, that we looked at anywhere from 500 to 850. I will say the racetrack is probably considerably cheaper than that. Um, and that's, I'm talking about just steroids or steroids and hyaluronic acid. If you start getting into some of the regenerative therapies like stem cells, PRP, et cetera, um, that'll add probably another 1500 to 2000, depending on the product onto that. Um, so again, I made the comment that this is something that I found uh, as COVID hit and the shows stopped that we had a lot of clients curtailing some of this spending. Um, and, and certainly, you know, within reason. Um, emergencies, this is another one. This is the unexpected uh, budget that you have to kind of put in there. And again, ranges I'm giving you, if you have a colic you know, at your farm and the ambulatory veterinary comes out or a laceration, that could go potentially higher depending on the extent of the laceration, how long it takes. Um, swollen eyes, very common that we see, sometimes ulcers. Um, so some of the things you see here. And then I, I put orthopedic just as a, a random one that could be say from a foot abscess to uh, maybe you know, some type of arthritis. This can vary depending on what kind of diagnostics like x-rays you're doing. Um, but again, my idea here is you probably should start thinking about some of these budgets and putting this into plan into a plan so that you as a business owner 
can actually see and prepare accordingly. So it's not a decision last minute where it has to be emotions and a lot of stress. The colic numbers, this is one that everybody's uh, worried about. So on average in the Northeast for what we call large colon displacement, these horses, typically it's a relatively easy surgery and the colic standpoint uh, surgery. Uh, these horses will go home in three to five days. They're usually on feed within 24 hours. Um, on average in the Northeast, we're looking at between 10 and 14,000. That being said, I, I, anybody who has a hospital will tell you if you have post-operative complications or more severe type surgery, it is not uncommon for horses to leave for 20 to 30,000 from hospitals if they're in the hospital for two weeks or longer. So why is that important? Even though I'm quoting you 10 to 14 in the field, I don't know which one's going to be the $25,000 uh, price. So the question is, is how do you decide that? And are you going to make a decision after you've done the surgery and say, well, I'm out of buddy now and there's, you know, there's nowhere else to go. And, and we all understand that. Please recognize the veterinarians are not judging any of that. We just need to see where your financial comfort is. Um, most of the insurance coverage is going to be 75000 sorry, $7,500. And that is because that's what the insurance companies have made the national average what a colic surgery is. So as you can see, even if you do have medical insurance, major medical, you're still going to pay a fair bit out of pocket, even if it's a uncomplicated routine, quote unquote, uh, colic surgery. Medical colics in this area, I used to quote between three and 5,000 where these horses go into the clinic for a couple of days or on IV fluids. The fluids have exponentially gone up in price. Um, so we're, we're up around four to six now. And I think it's every reason to expect that to be five to seven in another year or two. So my friend at Blue Bridal, she had a great quote here and I, and I really like it. Um, and her comment was, you know, the veterinary bills don't discriminate. The laceration on the Olympic horse is the same as the backyard pony. Um, and and it's, it's really, really, really spot on. And, you know, I'll add into that, you know, we have a lot of clients that are good Samaritans. They want to adopt, um, you know, uh, wayward animals, and I'm all for that. Um, but there's financial responsibility to it. And uh, we often find a lot of clients like to, you know, uh, take on a mini or a, a mini donkey or a donkey. And, they're stuck off to the side and they're not really considered an expense. They're actually thought in the farm just to be, you know, uh, window dressing on things. But I'm going to tell you that in most cases, from the veterinary standpoint, they're the hardest ones to treat, mostly because many of them are feral and people don't, you know, train them like horses. They treat them like, you know, backyard pets that just stand out there. Um, trying to do vaccines on our mini donkeys take us three times as longer than any other uh, animal out there uh, trying to do a laceration repair on those guys can be challenging if they're not if they're not handled if they're not domesticated with it um, and I shouldn't say domesticated trained is what I mean to say um, so you know I, I would then say to horse owners and I appreciate everybody being good Samaritans but you also have to have the money for that and you know I rec recognize that I have empathy and sympathy you know for that and I want to help uh, to some degree but then again, when it comes down to me running a business, you know, it's not something that I should keep losing money on for my business um, because it's something that you wanted to do as a horse owner. Um, so, look, we all want to work with our clients, and, and I would encourage you to speak with your veterinarians and have these conversations before you have the incident because nobody wants to be having it when you have, uh, you know, bills in front of you. Um, so as I start wrapping this up, um, I, I guess there's some questions here. What do I, and I, I thought about like, what can I expect horse owners and trainers and everybody to expect in terms of changes in equine veterinary medicine? I think you're going to see less and less solo practitioners. Um, I mean, I, I still think you're going to have solo practitioners. I don't think they're ever going to go away, but I think it's going to be less common, especially in the highly concentrated um, equine areas. Um, most of you have probably seen that about 60% of the small animal hospitals are corporately owned now. And you're gonna start seeing that happen in equine. It is already happening, I will tell you. Uh, it's happening with the larger practices right now. They're going under corporate ownership. Um, and I think you're, you're probably seeing it now and you'll probably see it longer that people are gonna start running their practices more like a business. 
and with business models and business philosophies. And I think, frankly, horse owners and barn owners and facility owners and trainers should start doing that as well. And I will tell you that we're all bad at it and we have to get better as a collective group because that's the way we're going to have to make our industry sustain. Uh, I know when COVID hit, or well, because I was concerned, I didn't really know how things were going to happen. Uh, I was concerned about cash flow. So I, instead of billing at the end of the month or the beginning of the following month, I told all my clients we were going to do time of service payments. And um, we've kept it that way. And I have found that there are many more equine practices that are doing that. Most clients uh, keep credit cards on file or have a, a direct payment plan that they do. I shouldn't say payment plan, but a direct uh, system where once the services are rendered, it's automatically uh, paid. And so you're going to see less and less delayed billing. Uh, and so I think that's something that's a huge factor that people need to be aware of. You're going to see the continual improvement in diagnostics and technology in veterinary medicine, and that's only going to increase prices. And, you know, you probably don't see it or realize it, but any retailer, uh, any restaurant on an annual basis raises their fees three, five, eight, sometimes 10% every year. Um, and veterinarians are, are terrible at doing that. And we have to get better at that. And there's no reason we shouldn't go and do that. Um, and, you know, one of the things that people don't think about, it's funny, telemedicine made this big surgence now during COVID. Now, so you can go online or, or on a phone and talk to your physician. And it was this miraculous thing that, oh, we can practice medicine this way. Veterinarians have been doing this, equine veterinarians have been doing this for years. I mean, how many times do we get texts, um, you know, videos from our clients? Hey, look at this laceration. You need to come out and do it. And we don't charge for any of that time. And I think you're going to start finding practices do that because as like everybody else, all of our times are becoming more valuable. And, you know, if I hire a consultant or an attorney, they're charging me $450, 475 an hour. Um, you know, I, I don't have, I don't do prices quite that high with it. Um, and, I don't see why I shouldn't, because I think we provide the same type of service that a consultant or uh, an attorney might do as well. So I think it is something that we're going to start seeing down the road. Um, I mentioned before that I think you're going to see less and less practices, all, all the veterinary practices offering emergency services. You're probably already seeing that now. And that changes. Uh, and the changes are going along with that. So that means you have to make sure you understand who your emergency veterinarian is and what um, fees are associated with their practice if it's a different veterinarian than you're used to. So I already alluded to some of this, but overall, I think we all have to improve our business model. Uh, I think we have to start budgeting accordingly. And, and, and more importantly, I think we need to be honest with what financial resources we have. Um, and, and I'm talking probably in this case is the farm owner. You know, when I come and offer you a service, I expect you to know what your financial resources, what your debt load is, and what you truly can afford. Saying, well, I'm going to do it, and then worrying about how you're going to pay for it later on, that's not fair to the veterinarian, because now the veterinarian stuck holding the bill there until you come up with the payment um, that you think is appropriate. And, and I don't think, I, I really, I, I would encourage you to speak to your veterinarians, because one of the things that uh, gets my goat quite a bit is when clients feel that they will dictate how much they want to pay towards their bill. Um, you know, I'm not a credit card company. Uh, I have, I have my own bills I have to do. So I am willing to work with payment plans on my, you know, valued clients, but it has to be a mutually agreeable type of payment plan. And it can't be just on your terms. I too have a business and I have rules how I need to run my business. So again, I think you need to be honest, uh, with yourself. Um, and I think you need to start prioritizing and considering the veterinarian. And again, I, I hate to make this sound like sour grapes and it's not meant that way, but um, I do think people have looked to veterinarians as, oh, well, you know, we'll do the vaccines. That's all I need them for this year. I, I don't think it's unreasonable to expect to have an emergency once a year on a horse. I, I, I just don't. And I think at some point in the lifetime of your horse, I think you need to anticipate that you may have the discussion of whether the horse should go to colic surgery. And I do think having an understanding of what you're willing to spend financially and uh, ability wise, I think you should make that decision before you're in the emotional time of the stress of the horse going to the clinic and having that go on. Um, so I think you need to have a dialogue with your veterinarians. We certainly remain sympathetic. Um, we're gonna continue to provide the optimal veterinary service and we're gonna improve and give you innovative veterinary medicine. 
uh, but we have to figure a way that we can sustain our industry and keep it going. And that's in a way, you know, we're, we're going to strengthen our human animal bond if we continue to do that. So um, I, I thank everybody for their attention. Um, I'm sure there are several questions to go and I'll, I'll leave it to, to Dr. Williams as to whether you want to tackle some of that now or you want to do it uh, later on. Are you there, Dr. Williams? I am. Sorry. Oh, hello. I'm just playing with multiple windows and multiple things and, and multiple everything. So uh, so thank you very much, um, Dr. Pagaro. Um, for the sake of time, there's just one kind of topic that I want to bring up that I want to ask you um, that, that kind of was a, a little bit of a re re reoccurring theme of questions. And so I'll ask you it now. Um, and then I'll um, actually ask Dr. McCreel if you want to go ahead and get um, your slide shared and everything, we can go ahead and get her set up as well. But um, Dr. Pergaro, um, you had mentioned, um, you know, about the, the decrease in um, veterinary students. And I think this is a really good question. Um, what is the industry doing to get more students interested in entering the- So it, it, it's, not, it's not a decrease in veterinary students. It's, it's a decrease in equine veterinarians when they come out. We still have an interest in equine veterinarians, but the challenge with it is, is you know, uh, a lot of the reason why equine veterinarians don't sustain is it's a tough lifestyle. Anybody who's been involved in the industry knows that it's a tough work life balance and you can make considerably more money and work a third of the time in small animals. And that's really what it comes down to. Um, it really, it, it has, and somebody's pointing out, it is a very, very high suicide rate. Um, that is not just equine related. That's actually across the board um, on both small and large animal. So what are we doing for it? I mean, that's what part of this discussion was of, of my presentation was we have to start running it like a business. In order for me to entice and encourage the next generation of veterinarians, I have to pay them such that and such that and they have to be able to have a lifestyle that they feel is acceptable to them and that they'll be happy and be able to stay in that this industry. And so I think it's something that we have to all consider as a collective group. Yeah, because I think that was definitely, I might have rephrased, phrased the question wrong, but they said, you know, what is the industry doing to, to get more equine, uh, equine practitioners, really? So, um, and just on one of your particular slides, you were talking about colic, and a question came through that asked, what is the percentage of the colic cases that are actually surgical cases? And I thought that was... Uh, okay, so let's not even talk about going into the hospital, but the large majority of uh, colics that we see out in the field. It, it's called by, call the equine veterinarian out to look at them. I would say 70, 80%, maybe even higher are going to be gas colics that resolve with a single dose of an anti-inflammatory and move on. It's certainly a much lower, lower percentage, but it doesn't matter how low it is. Uh, if it's your horse, you're going to remember it all the time. Um, and it'll seem like it was, you know, 80%, but it's not. It's probably it's probably less than 20%, and it's probably even lower than that. I don't actually have that exact number. I'll see while uh, Lindsay's talking, I'll see if I can come up with a, a number for you. Great. Well, thank you. Let's all thank Dr. Figaro with a, a virtual clap um, or, you know, whatever, the, the shaky hands. Um, so thank you, uh, Dr. Figaro, very much. Um, I am now going to ask uh, Dr. McCreel if you want to go ahead and turn on your your video, I'm going to go ahead and um, read your bio and then I will turn it over uh, to you. So uh, Dr. McCreel was born and raised in Ontario, Canada. She was admitted to the Ontario Veterinary College at the age of 20, having decided that she would pursue a, queer, a career in equine medicine. Dr. McCreel elected to complete an equine internship at Fairfield Equine Associates in Connecticut under the tutelage of Dr. Rich, uh, Richard Mitchell. He's a seven time Olympic team veterinarian. It was during this time and during her internship that she great, uh, gained a tremendous amount of knowledge and expertise in lameness and performance medicine. Dr. McCreel was then offered the opportunity to spend the winter season practicing with her vet, practicing her veterinary skills on top notch show horses at the world class show grounds in Wellington, Florida. Dr. McCreel joined Foundation Equine in 2006 as an associate veterinarian and became partner of the practice in 2012. 
So thank you very much, Dr. McCreo, for joining us. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me tonight. We're going to do some tips for soundness in your horse. Um, you've had some time to see the overview, so I'm not going to go over it. I hope you got to see the little cartoon on the side there I thought was pretty funny. So we are going to start. The best way to keep a sound horse is really to start with a sound horse. So we're going to talk about the pre-purchase examination. Um, and we're going to go over this a little bit. So this is an examination performed by a veterinarian. And I put in big letters prior to the purchase of a horse. You'd be surprised how many times we look at the horse after people have already bought it, which was, doesn't do much good. Um, and to understand a little bit about the pre-purchase examination, it used to be considered, people say, did my horse pass? Did the horse fail? This is not a pass-fail kind of exam. A pre-purchase gives a risk assessment of the horse. So basically two horses may have a similar finding on a pre-purchase, but given that one is supposed to go to the Olympics and one is supposed to be a trail horse, it is not going to be the same assessment for those horses. And so generally what the veterinarian will give you is whether they think the horse is suitable for the purpose that you want that horse. Now, not all pre-purchases are the same. So different veterinarians have different ways of performing the pre-purchase. We're all kind of looking at the same things, but a, they may not all cost the same. B, they may not all include the same things. And there's going to be different add-ons that are included in that pre-purchase. So uh, A, it is really important that when you're looking to have a pre-purchase done, you talk to the veterinarian who's going to do it and make sure you have a clear idea of what that veterinarian is going to be doing in the pre-purchase, uh, what their pre-purchase or standard pre-purchase includes. And you may or may not be using your own veterinarian for the pre-purchase, um, but I would recommend if you have a relationship with your with a veterinarian that you speak to them about what you should have done in that pre-purchase. What is included could be, is obviously going to be a basic physical exam and a lameness exam, um, but there's going to be different add-ons in there that you may or may not want. So you may want uh, certain x-rays done, you may want ultrasounds done, um, and those should all be discussed. So use your professionals, including your trainer, to help you decide what to do on a pre-purchase. And I just wanted to mention a conflict of interest. So that is when um, a veterinarian may decide not to do a pre-purchase for you if they do work for both the seller and the buyer. Um, and it may come up that if there's a problem with the pre-purchase, um, you know, they may be accused of siding with one person. So those are the things that you would need checked out with a pre-purchase. So start with a sound horse, or at least start with a horse that you know the problems and are willing to accept. So let's move on to foot care. The famous expression, no hoof, no horse is really very true. There is no one recipe that works for every horse when it comes to foot care. And I'm especially going to focus on trimming and shoeing in this presentation. Um, I'm gonna stay away from basic treatments for thrush and, and things like that. And we're gonna talk more, a little bit more advanced on the, on the, the shoeing and, and trimming principles. One of the key factors that I will mention again and again in this presentation is using your professionals. So in this case, it's going to be your veterinarians and it's going to be your farriers and it may be your trainers. Um, but if you have any question about whether you're doing the right thing with your horse, those are the people that you need to go to. There are people there that can support you and can help you get the right answers. So when it comes to foot care, uh, I recommend a yearly physical exam by your veterinarian, which is gonna include hopefully a thorough examination of your horse's feet. So you, are, you know, have the opportunity, you have your veterinarian out, look at the rest of the horse, but particularly focus on your horse's feet and ask lots of questions at that point. Ask them to examine them, ask them if there's anything 
that uh, they think that they should do differently. And one of the things that they may do uh, would be to recommend uh, x-rays, radiographs, because these are really important for us as veterinarians to help you get the most out of your horse's feet. So we're gonna spend a very short period of time going over normal anatomy, normal equine anatomy of the foot. And so as you can see, I hope you can see my little cursor here. Um, there are three bones in the lower leg and we don't need to know the names of them, uh, but they see that they are in alignment. And these are really important uh, bones when we start to look at the horse's feet and angles and how to trim a horse. Um, and so it's important to understand that um, this linear uh, column does exist in the horse. And then beyond these uh, bones, we have other supporting structures that are the soft tissues that play along with that as well. It's also important to understand what the bottom of your horse's foot looks like. You know, very often we see some abnormalities on the bottom of a horse's foot but don't really know if they're normal or abnormal for the horse. And so having an understanding of what the frog is supposed to look like, you know, is it um, protruding past the foot? Is it sunken into the foot? Does it seem like one side is bigger than the other? Is it painful when you push on it? Uh, is there anything abnormal in the, in the, in the frog and the grooves in the foot? Being able to isolate where your horse's white line is. Does that look thickened? Um, is there erosion in there? So getting a really good idea of what is normal for your horse or for any horse can really help you find something that may be abnormal, which then either you can address if you know what it is, or you can take it to your veterinarian who will then help you decide uh, what to do about it. So we're going to go a little deeper into um, the basics of trimming and looking at angles and um, you know what maybe uh, your horse's foot looks like compared to another horse and what's ideal and just to give you a little bit more um, information on what to what to be looking at when you come to looking at your horse's feet. So there are three horse feet here um, which are clearly all the same horse and I don't really know how they made them all look uh, different like this, but um, A is a fairly ideal conformation on a horse. And you can see that the yellow line runs from basically the middle of the ankle through the coronary band, kind of at the widest part of the coronary band and runs out the foot at about the area where the first nail hole would be in your horse's foot. And you can see that that is a straight line from the, from the ankle down to the ground surface. And that is looking at the angulation of those bones that we looked at back in the, in the hoof anatomy. So this is called a hoof pastern angle axis. And it really should be a straight line in a horse. Now, there are very, very few horses who actually have a perfectly straight line there. And we understand that, but that is sort of our goal and that the horse then biomechanically has the greatest advantage of not having problems uh, in terms of soundness if they have this ideal conformation. B is more of your clubbed foot horse. And now if you look at that yellow line, you'll see that it extends you know, from, the, from the ankle to the coronary band in a pretty straight line. And then it uh, basically bulges forward um, and then goes in a steeper angle down to the ground. So that's gonna be your more clubbed foot horse. And then in C, again, you'll see that the line is pretty straight from the ankle to the coronary band, but then uh, ends up with a horse with a low uh, heel angle and a long toe, and that's a broken back axis. So this is what it looks like uh, if you could, you know, put your x-ray vision on and see inside the horse. Now they're in a little bit different order in this slide, but you can see the broken forward. You can see that the bone down inside the foot is going to be pointing a little bit more down towards the ground. 
And so when that horse is landing, it's going to put more stress onto that bone when it lands, because the point of that bone is going to be hitting, hitting the ground. In the second image, where now the, the bone inside of the foot, which is called the coffin bone, uh, is pointing up a little bit, and there's a curve to the front of the pastern. And in that particular conformation, the horse is going to be putting a lot more tension and pressure on the soft tissue structures um, of the leg. And finally, on the right is the more normal conformation. You'll see where we're back to that straight line. And that conformation is going to promote uh, less risk, basically, of, of lanes. So one of the most, probably the most common problem I see with horse feet are too long a toe. And I have these two x-rays side by side, uh, one to show the two different um, axes. One on the right hand side where it says the right foot, it's more of the clubby conformation. And on the left is more of the broken back axis. And you can see that both of these horses, although very different looking, have long toes. So we see this over and over again. And sometimes it's very, very hard to judge whether your horse has long toes or not. And so this is where I would encourage, if it's financially possible, um, to have x-rays done at a certain point in your horse's career. Um, if you can do it once a year, or if you can do it you know, more often, that's even better. Of course, we would never you know, ask you to do that, but it certainly does give a lot of information. Um, we tend to take x-rays when horses are having problems, but probably better yet would be to take the x-rays before they're having problems so that we can kind um, try to prevent the problems from happening. So this slide, um, it, we're gonna delve into a little bit here um, so that when and if you have x-rays of your horse's foot, you know a little bit about what you're looking at. Because um, when you have your horse in front of you, you have the veterinarian with you and they are talking about all the different principles of shoeing and they're talking to your farrier, uh, you may not really understand what they're talking about. And so I'm going to go over just a couple of general things that next time you look at a horse's foot x-ray, <clears throat> you may understand a little bit about what we're talking about. So we talked about the toe length already, um, and I'm going to bring that up again. So uh, in this particular horse, um, you can ignore some of these measurements that are on here. I'm not gonna necessarily talk about this specifically, but um, my little general finding has been, and this is just, just mine, nobody else probably says this, but I look at the length of the navicular bone, which is this little bone right here, um, and I would say if you were to put that bone in front of the toe, most of the time the toe should be about the same length as that navicular bone or maybe one and a half times. If it extends longer than that, I feel the toe is, is most likely too long on that horse. Now, of course, not every horse is going to fit in this profile. There's so many different variations of feet, but for some general rules, um, it will help with you know, looking at to determine whether the horse's toe is too long. Now that you know about the angles of the foot um, and the pastern, you can look to see if the, the bones um, are lined up and in a straight line. And in an ideal horse, if you were to draw the line through these three bones, they really should make a straight line. And you can see in this horse, where if you were to draw that line through, it would be coming out the bottom of the foot and not out the tip of the, of the coffin bone here. So this horse has a um, you know, broken back confirmation. The other thing for you to look at when you look at the horse's x-ray is the angle of the bottom of the bone, the coffin bone, to the ground surface. Then that may be a shoe or it may be the ground if the horse is barefoot. And so you can see in this x-ray the horse's foot, uh, coffin bone, and the shoe are perfectly parallel to each other. So if you were to make an angle between those two, it would be zero. An ideal horse does not have a zero angle there. An ideal horse would have a 
positive angle, which means that the point of the coffin bone, uh, the tip of the coffin bone here, would be pointing down a little bit, and the heel of the coffin bone would be higher. And that is where a horse is supposed to be sitting, and is one of the goals that we try to accomplish when we're trimming and shoeing horses. So the final uh, tip for you to look at if you're looking at horses is shoe placement. So I'm not sure that you can see this faint green circle that's right here, but it's basically a circle that is uh, circling around the joint here called the coffin joint. And if you take the very base of that circle and you run that down to the ground, in an ideal horse, that shoe should be sitting 50% in front of the line and 50% behind the line. And you can see in this particular horse, there's a lot more shoe sitting here out in front of that line, uh, probably two thirds approximately, and one third sitting back here. So this shoe is sitting too far forward on this horse and is not offering enough support to this horse's foot. So that's a very simple thing for you to look at. Now, we're not going to accomplish in every single horse having a 50-50 ratio, but it is a goal to work towards as you're trying to um, establish a good shoe uh, principle in your horse. So long toes. Now let's say we don't have the benefit of x-rays. <coughs> Excuse me. What are some things that you can look at that might help you determine if your horse has a long toe? So one of the things would be a dish in the front of the foot. And you can see in this top image, the dish in the, in the front of the hoof wall, which they then serially trimmed away to make the toe a lot shorter and much more normal hoof shape. So uh, whether your horse is upright or low heel, you know, low heels, um, should not have a dish in the foot. And that probably indicates that the horse's toe is too long. The other thing would be uh, over here on the, on the right hand side of the screen. If the horse has the broken back axis that we talked about, chances are the horse is going to have too much toe. These are no guarantees by any means. Uh, each horse has a different foot, but it would be something for you to look at um, and be suspicious that, you know, maybe if you're seeing that there is something that can be corrected uh, through pulling back the toe and, and, and reestablishing the balance. And finally, this is an extreme example, of course, but um, if you pick up the horse's foot and it looks like the shoe fits the bottom of the foot from the bottom, but then you put the horse's foot down and you look from the side and the shoe looks way too far forward, chances are that that horse has too much toe. So those are some little, little tidbits for um, times when we don't have x-rays to get a little sense of looking at your horse's foot if you think you have too much toe on your horse's foot. One of the other little rules of thumb, um, little tips that I have is I look at, I run my hands down the cannon bone from the side. I run my fingers down the middle of the cannon bone and I follow that all the way to the ground surface. And in A, you can see that if you do that, you run a line through the middle of the cannon bone, that that line should hit right at the horse's heel ball. And this goes for, uh, for me, when I look at a horse to see if the shoe is in the right place, I feel like the back of the shoe should be sitting about where that line would hit. So you're running your hand down the cannon bone, straight line all the way to the ground, is that shoe, back of that shoe hitting that line? Or is it sitting half an inch forward from there? Generally, I would say it doesn't go behind where you are, but that could be the case if the horse had trailers. Um, and so you can see, you know, with the different conformations, though, that line will, will end up not at the heel bulb anymore, but that may be where the back of the shoe is actually supposed to land on those horses um, if they're going to be shod properly. So that's a little, a little tip for you to, to do that with your horses and see where your horse's shoe is sitting based on that trick. And then for the hind feet, we tend to ignore hind feet uh, a lot when it comes to shoeing. Uh, we really shouldn't, but um, we're starting to, to focus more and more on the hind feet. 
but a little tip for the hind feet that's pretty neat um, is drawing a line out of the coronary band. So pretend there's a laser pointer that is at the horse's coronary band and you shoot that laser pointer towards the horse's front leg. And a horse that has a fairly good angle, that line is going to end up somewhere between the knee and the elbow on that horse. In a horse that has a low angle, that line will hit the horse somewhere on the belly. Um, and of course, a horse that has a really upright conformation, which doesn't happen too much in the hind legs, but I guess it could, um, it would be pointing somewhere below the knee. So if you stand your horse square and you pretend you're a laser pointer, see where that line falls on your horse. And you may be surprised, you know, about the angles of the hind feet. So it's really important that you schedule consistent, timely and productive farrier appointments. Uh, waiting an extra week or two um, is probably not a good idea. Um, trying to get away with stuff never seems to really work. So um, when you're budgeting your, your farrier appointments, it's not something you should skip on because your horse's uh, feet really are very, very important. So random tip has nothing really to do with uh, uh, hoofs, but there was a study that was uh, recently done. And you see in this picture that this horse is wearing one bell boot. Um, this horse didn't lose the other one. It was done on purpose. And the study has shown that horses who are not lame, but that have maybe a weakness in one direction versus the other, is that you can improve that weakness by putting one bell boot on your horse when you're riding. And the reason for that is, is that one bell boot stimulates that weak leg to work a little bit harder and you may actually be able to resolve some of the, the one-sided weakness in that horse. We're gonna move on to saddle fits because um, lameness doesn't just come from the legs. So saddle fit can result obviously in poor performance and, and sometimes into secondary lameness if the horses aren't, you know, aren't moving properly. So again, here is, is I'm reiterating, there are professionals to help you with this too. There are, you can, you can ask your veterinarians for help with this a little bit. We, we know the basics. Um, or you can go to saddle fitters who, who do this for a living and can help you with this. So we're just gonna go over some basic points that you can look at. By no means, you know, will you be a qualified saddle fitter um, at the end of this presentation, but you can go look at your saddle and see if um, that saddle is fitting with some of these basic principles that we're going to go over. So the picture is sort of self-explanatory here, but um, the front of the saddle really needs to sit behind the horse's shoulder blades. One of the things I see a lot is when people are putting their saddles on, they like to pull it forward over the withers and then slide it back, um, which we are taught to do, but sometimes we don't slide it back far enough and it ends up being up on top of the horse's shoulder which then of course doesn't allow the horse to stride out properly and also probably pinches the withers, which is something that horses really don't like uh, when their withers are being pinched with the saddle. Alternatively in the back, the saddle shouldn't go beyond the last rib. Um, and so you can, you can feel the last rib on your horse, uh, depending on how conditioned they are. It may be easier than others. Um, follow that rib up to uh, as far up as you can feel towards the back. And the, the back of the saddle really shouldn't be sitting too far back past that line. Then you're gonna look at the angle that the saddle makes with your horse. So this is just an image of um, too wide. Um, and so if your saddle is too wide, you're going to end up with pinching in some spots and gaps in other spots with that saddle. In an ideal world, it's going to sit nicely against the horse, um, horse's withers. And so you're gonna look in this picture, you wanna make sure that the saddle <clears throat> fits very nicely along the curvature of the horse's wither and shoulder there, um, and that you don't have big gaps either 
up here at the top or down at the bottom. You want to make sure that there's enough clearance between the front of the saddle and the horse's withers. Uh, the saddle should not be sitting right on the withers. There should be a gap there. You also want to make sure that there's not uh, six inches between the, the saddle and, and the withers on that horse. So again, this uh, reiterates one of the points that I already said, but placing the saddle um, behind the shoulders, is really important. Um, but really I wanted this picture to show you that the saddle should be sitting flat on the horse's back, but also for the rider. The rider needs to be sitting flat. So you don't want the back of the saddle <clears throat> being tipped up or the front of the saddle being tipped up. It should really be sitting in a flat line. So those are your basic um, saddle fitting tips that you can um, now go and, and try at home and look. And I would suggest that you, when you try it at home, that you put the saddle on the horse's back without all the pads. Pads are not necessarily a solution for a bad fitting saddle, although we do use them for that purpose. But in an ideal world, your saddle would fit the horse without the use of any pads. So now I'm gonna go over a, a little, little story here. Um, it was a fairly bad summer for you. Your horse had an eye injury, couldn't really ride him for the last uh, month of the summer. And then you were going to, away to college, super excited about that, but you weren't gonna be home for a while and your horse was just gonna hang out a little bit. But the good news was, is you were going to be home for the turkey trot, which if you're from this area of New Jersey, pretty much all horse people know what the turkey trot is. If you're from anywhere else, you can imagine what it might be. So it's October and uh, you're super excited. You've come home from school and your horse is, you know, now ready to go. You, you clean off the mud and you get your saddle and your bridle cleaned and up you go to the, to the turkey trot. And you go to the start and your horse is super excited because it hasn't been ridden in three months and off you go and you have a wonderful time. And sometimes, you know, maybe you do canter a little bit too much, but you know, it was a great day. And you come home and the next day before you have to go back to school, you decide to take your horse out and ride again. And uh oh, something's not right. So we're gonna talk about fitness. That horse, your horse obviously wasn't fit enough to do the turkey trot and, and now suffering some consequences. So there is multiple parts to fitness, um, as you can see in this wordy slide a little bit. So um, cardiovascular, so cardiovascular fitness is an improved ability to deliver oxygen to the tissues. So basically your, your heart uh, pumps stronger, pumps better, can deliver oxygen and oxygen is needed for those tissues choose to perform normal functions. So insufficient oxygen results in stress, which can lead to injury. Then there's the muscular system. So muscles, as they get more fit, will learn to use the oxygen that you're providing them more efficiently, uh, which means that they will have uh, more oxygen and, and less times will they, will they run out of oxygen. Then there is adaptations in fitness in the supporting structures. So there will be an increase in size and or strength of bone, ligaments, tendons, and muscles. So basically over time, as you know, if you're a bodybuilder, you're gonna work those muscles and they're gonna increase in size, but also uh, bone density increases with fitness, ligament strength and tendons uh, also adapt and increase with fitness. Uh, less thought of probably is temperature regulation. So increased heat loss efficiency during exercise. So the more fit you are, the better you are at, at getting rid of the heat. Um, and too much heat can increase tissue damage, which can lead to injury. And finally, uh, fitness involves the central nervous system. So improved coordination, which allows exercise to be more efficient and effective. So basically your nerves, which tell your body how to move, um, allow you to do those things that you want to do in an easier way um, and a safer way so that you're more or less likely to injure yourself. To remember that younger horses will adapt 
more quickly than older horses to fitness. Um, it is the curse of being old, of course, but um, we have to remember that when we have take our when we have our horses. Um, fitness involves a dedicated plan for exercise, probably at least four times per week. Um, in an ideal situation, if not, if you're training for the Olympics, it's probably more than that. It's okay if you can't accomplish this. We know that not everybody can ride four four times a week. May only be once, may not be at all. But it just means you can't push your horse past what he or she is conditioned for. So you could only do as much as your horse is trained for. So that's important to remember. That means, like in the example, probably shouldn't go on the turkey trot if you haven't you know, ridden your horse for the last three months. Remember, each discipline may require different types of conditioning. And this is where I'm going to suggest another professional, trainers, to help you. Um, help come up with a plan of how to train your horse, strengthen your horse for the particular discipline that you want to do. And finally, remember that cardiovascular fitness occurs much quicker in horses than musculoskeletal adaptations. So your horse may be able to do everything you ask without, without breaking a sweat, you know, or without breathing heavy, <clears throat> but it doesn't mean that the tendons and ligaments have adapted at that point and they may need further time before they're able to, to you know, keep up with the cardiovascular system. So I, I took this quote from Dr. Gore, um, each new level of training is maintained until the body has adapted to the added stress, after which a further increase in training load can be applied. On the other hand, Excessive overload or a rapid increase in the load over a short period of time will inevitably result in a failure of one or more body systems. So that just sort of sums it up. Then also there's nutritional considerations um, in terms of fitness. So you have to look at, um, you know, overconditioned horse. Does a horse need to lose some weight before it can do the job that you want it to do? And also does the horse have enough calories um, and enough you know, bodybuilding uh, enough protein to build the muscles that you want it to build. So there's the nutritional considerations as well. So we're going to move on to footing and go a little bit into um, the different, trying to decide what is the best footing for your horse. And there's really, uh, as you'll, uh, you'll see, is there's no real answer to that yet. Um, what we know about footing, though, is that hard footing increases the forces on bone and cartilage of the leg. And so it may predispose to osteoarthritis, uh, cause bone bruising, and uh, potentially navicular. Navicular uh, syndrome is very multifactorial, though. So, um, but there is some thought that it could result in at least navicular bruising. And then soft, deep footing increases strain on the soft tissue structures of the limbs, so exactly the opposite, and it's going to predispose to tendon and ligament injuries. So are you confused about your footing? Well, really, so am I. Uh, everybody has their favorite footing. Everybody has different ideas about footing. There are uh, synthetic footings. There are natural footings. People are spending lots and lots of money now on putting in uh, these synthetic footing rings um, only to decide maybe to take them out because they are having too many, um, specifically it seems suspensory injuries. And so I think the jury really is out on, on the best footing. And I don't know that we've actually come up with it, it, what it is yet, but here come my tips. And uh, these were taken from the AAP website um, I didn't feel I had to reinvent the wheel here. Um, and so basically some tips for you in footing is work your horse on a variety of different types of footing. If you always work on the same footing, your horse is ill-equipped to cope with any other type of footing. So your horse will adapt to the type of footing that you are on, um, which means that when you do change that footing, they may be predisposed to injury because they're so adapted to one particular type that they, you know, if you do the same workload on the new footing, they may not be able to, to tolerate that. Try to do some training on the same type of footing that you will compete on. 
Abrupt changes in footing are one of the leading causes of injury. So that makes sense. Not always possible. Um, avoid inconsistent footing. Surfaces that have soft and hard spots, deep and shallow spots or dry and slick spots can be dangerous. That also makes sense. Although probably working all the time on something that is perfectly groomed means that if you are uh, going somewhere where it's not perfectly groomed, you may predispose your horse to injury. So I think all these are subjective, but they are, they are just guidelines. Um, common sense is always is the best, you know, best thing to consider with common sense. And then this sort of goes back with the, the last topic, but make sure your horse is trained and conditioned for the job you're asking him to do. A horse lacking in fitness rapidly becomes fatigued and is more susceptible to injury. So give your horse a chance whenever possible to adapt to new footing. So you get a new horse, he or she may be fairly fit. You may have you know, purchased them from a, a home where uh, they were in full work, but uh, where they had a synthetic footing ring, you have a uh, deeper sand ring. You may not want to uh, start that horse at the same level of activity that they were in their previous home because they haven't had a chance to adapt to the new footing. So if suddenly the horse was jumping three foot on the synthetic footing and you bring them home, you jump three foot on the sand, uh, it is possible that this horse will end up with some sort of soft tissue injury. Be selective of the places you go. So this is more for, I, I guess, trail riding and, and horse showing if you're going to uh, different places. But if the footing is bad and you don't have to ride there, maybe you shouldn't, or you should select a different place to go. <coughs> so you want to use your common sense. My favorite footing is grass. Um, and I feel that grass offers both soft and hard, as long as it's not muddy and slippery. And if I had uh, my druthers, I would have everybody ride on a, on a nice grass footing. So another little random tip that I thought, this is uh, going away from actually hoof and foot care, but this is one for scratches. This is my, you know, if you're trying to actually cut costs at home, this is my over-the-counter scratches ointment that includes desitin, monostat, and hydrocortisone cream. You mix all three of those together, sort of in equal proportions, and you slather that on your horse's scratches. And my, uh, I find that it really does help those scratches to go away. So early detection. Um, nobody knows your horse better than you do. Get to know what is normal for your horse so that you can detect when something is not normal. So this is gonna involve you learning and becoming very good with your hands on, on your horse's body. So doing frequent examinations of the hoof, legs, and torso. So you're gonna run your hands down each leg feeling for any swelling, heat, pain, or asymmetries. You wanna pick out the feet and look for any abnormalities and sensitivities. Um, and then look at your horse's top line. You wanna check the back for any hair loss, rubs, bumps, and get to know your horse's normal reaction to back palpation. So you can run your fingers down your horse's back um, and some horses, you know, are ticklish. Some horses uh, react at first. So do it a couple times with light pressure at first, um, getting a little bit stronger and get to know how your horse normally reacts to that palpation so that if it changes, you can um, know that there might be something going on. Same with their legs. Pick up each leg, run your hands down, squeeze on different parts of the leg. Learn what is normal for your horse. Learn how they react when you're doing those things. Because one of the big things is finding a change. Knowing what, um, what is normal for your horse can be the, the early detection for something being abnormal. <clears throat> Another source of early detection is with your veterinarian. And having a veterinarian do a soundness evaluation uh, along with a physical exam uh, my recommendation is once yearly. Um, obviously, you're having a problem, you would have the vet out more often, but to do a, a preventative evaluation, a yearly physical exam would be once a year. And that may include 
um, having the horse, jogging the horse in a straight line, seeing the horse lunging, even seeing the horse under saddle, potentially doing some flexion tests. Obviously the veterinarian is gonna palpate all the limbs, uh, put hoof testers on. So many vet practices will have uh, a wellness program which often will include some of these services. And it's very valuable um, in terms of, A, your veterinarian will get a baseline exam on your horse. So they'll know if there's a problem following up and also gives you a lot of information about your horse. And it will be imperative to detecting problems early on uh, in your horse's you know, soundness career. I mentioned here at the bottom, you can, you can look it up um, <clears throat> later on, uh, you know, on Google, Equinosis Q, it's a computerized lameness detection. It's the, called the lameness locator. You may have heard of it, uh, but it's kind of a cool device that attaches, you can see in the picture of the horse here has a black cap on and uh, a, a sensor on its right front foot. And you can barely see, but there is a sensor on, um, on its croup area. And this is um, basically connected to the computer and it will show a computerized analysis of the horse's gait. And it picks up any um, subtle to major lamenesses that the horse is showing, but it's certainly a way to track uh, the way a horse goes because you know, a veterinarian will come and look at your horse this year and say, yeah, well, there's a little asymmetry in the way it goes, but everything looks good. But do we really remember that a year later when we look at the horse again to say, oh yeah, I think it's a little worse. I think it's a little better. Um, and so this is just a way of tracking the way that your horse is, is, is going. So finally, <clears throat> um, last slide here. I think we're just right here on time at the 40 minute mark. So um, I just wanted you to look at these horses legs um, and to get an idea of what you should be looking at when you palpate your horse's legs. Um, this horse has very clean, very, you know, pretty clean legs. Um, when you run your hand down the horse's legs, between the knee and the cannon bone, you should pretty much have three uh, bands that you're going to feel. You're going to feel the two tendons on the back. You're going to feel an indent. You're going to feel a middle band. You're going to feel another indent. And you're going to feel the horse's cannon bone. So you want to be able to feel the indent in between those, those three structures. Um, and that's normal. So if you can't feel those indents, it might be a sign that there is a problem. Our horse has some swelling in its leg. <clears throat> the other thing you wanna feel for are uh, any bumps on the horse's leg. And so you may be able to see on this image right here, this horse has a little bump here, which in this case probably is just the end of the, of the split bone on this horse. But that would be something worth noting saying, okay, my horse does have, does have a bump here. And then you wanna run your hands down the pasterns. Do they feel uh, the same side by side? Do they feel about the same width if I put my hands around them? Feel along the coronary bands, are there any lumps or bumps? And then look down at the hooves. Do, um, do you see any cracks on the hooves? Is, is, the, um, is you know, one bulging somewhere? Is there a dish in one? Um, and those are the things that you want to do as you as you run down your horse's legs. And then you can pick up the legs <clears throat> to palpate them a little bit better, squeeze on the back of the tendons. Um, most horses will react the first time you push on them a little bit. Um, so you want to push several times to get them desensitized from the palpation. Um, and you know most horses after you squeeze a few times will stop reacting unless there is pain in that area. And then they will keep reacting every every time that you uh, you push on that. So that's where I'm um, ending for this evening, and I am going to come out and uh, stop sharing my presentation. Excellent. Thank you uh, very much, Dr. McCreel. Let's give her a big uh, virtual round of applause as well. Um, I am going to go ahead, I'm going to pin a couple of us to the screen and uh, we're going to start taking questions, but um, while everybody's thinking of present uh, questions that you might have, I know uh, 
my graduate student Jen has been keeping track and I've been trying to keep track of some that have come through. So we're gonna start with a few of those and then uh, just bear with us. We're gonna try to get through all of them, but I, I know we're a little bit late on time, but we also did start a little late. So um, we're definitely gonna try to get through, uh, get through everybody's here. Um, if we don't, I'd be happy to um, try to get answers for you and then um, you know, we can send you questions afterward as well. So um, if you guys don't mind, I will start off uh, first by saying we have, and if I don't, I, I, I don't, really don't wanna lose everybody. Um, so please, if anyone um, is going to leave or before you leave, um, we would really like to know your thoughts on the program. So I'm putting a survey evaluation in the chat for everybody to see. Um, if you can just click on that link now, you can take it afterward. You can take it while we're answering questions. I will also put it uh, in the chat again before we leave. But um, before you decide to log off, um, I would really appreciate uh, any of your feedback. It's just a really brief survey on the, on the program. So, so please fill that out. But thank you. So let me start off, uh, Mike, going back to, uh, to your talk. Um, and, and I wrote down a few as well. Some insurance. So there was, um, there, there's kind of two questions that, that sort of go together. And you mentioned about um, some horses not being worth insuring or, or the self-insured. And then, then really, what is your feeling of the best cost-effective uh, method of insurance? Yeah, you know, it's, it's really a very subjective thing and each individual has to make that decision. For some people, the insurance just doesn't provide them enough and they have that money set aside. Um, some put it in a bank account and so they're just going to go and self-insure and there's no reason for it to have insurance. Um, I think when it comes down to probably age probably plays a role because the question is, is, you know, we're starting to do colic surgery in much older horses now, like where it's not uncommon to do colic surgery in a 20 and higher 20 year old horse. Whereas when I came out of school, if you were doing it on a 17 or 18 year old, you're like, okay, well, if I'm not going to do it on a 17 or 18 year old, why would I carry the insurance? And that's probably one of the biggest things most people think about uh, for that. So I, again, I think you have to kind of figure out what works for you. And my, I would encourage you to speak to the brokers because they're the ones that kind of help out. And some people will tell them what they're looking for. And, and the brokers will say, a, a good broker will say, you really don't want to insure your horse. That's what it comes down to. Good, good, good answer. Uh, before you go any further, uh, but I, I should have known the number, um, but there was a study and I, I pulled it up from, it was a long time ago, um, but it said that in terms of incidents of colics, uh, and this was a study they looked at, I can't remember how many exact horses, but I think it was like 400 some horses, basically 4.2 colic events per 100 horses per year, just to give you an idea. So if you have 100 horses on a property, you're going to have about 4.2 colic episodes. Anywhere between one and three percent, depending on the study, can go to colic surgery. So it's a very, very low number. So that's one or two percent of the colics go to surgery, or of, of one or two percent of the colics will go to colic surgery. Correct. It'd be interesting though in the Mid Atlantic area. We seem to have more. Yeah, colics. absolutely. It's fun to see I, that regionally, right? I, I absolutely agree with that statement. Yeah. Th that study was done in '98, and it would be nicer to see a, a more recent one and demographically. Uh, somebody also asked, Kerry, sorry to steal your thunder there, about uh, off-the-track thoroughbreds uh, and insurance. It depends on the company, and you got to talk to the brokers on that one. Some, they will, will cover off-track thoroughbreds. They, they absolutely do. Um, yeah, somebody said I, the, I, and I commented that, you know, I, I have one that's been yeah. insured for years, and it's the same as my non-off-the-track. So. And... Um, Somebody said the ASPCA one did not. I, I did not know that. The one that I know, the one client that I had, it had a quarter horse. Interesting. Okay, I'll shut up. Go ahead. <laughs> That's all right. I'm going to uh, skip to Dr. McCreel. This is a question that was asked kind of early on in your presentation. Um, and, and you talked about having the hooves and the broken axes. Um, is there a different treatment uh, depending on the orientation of, of the breakage in the in the hoof and or is the the process basically similar for both oh it's so, so different and you know the reason i can't really get into i could get into general treatments but then we would be here still tomorrow um <laughs> you know so 
again, you know, I'm, I'm going to answer the question, but I think the best recommendation is to speak to your fairy or veterinarian to get the advice um, because each horse uh, is so complicated. Um, you know, we see a model of a, a picture of a horse and we say this is wrong, but there's still a whole other horse attached to that leg. Um, and some of it has to do, you know, with the rest of the conformation of the horse. Um, but there are some general principles for sure that we follow when we try to um, fix an alignment. And, you know, I say it's, it, it's not so easy to, to fix them because some horses have a, a, a ton of hoof growth. So they have, you know, we didn't get into sole thickness. Um, and so you have a lot of foot that you can cut away and other horses barely have anything. So where one horse you can make a huge change in one go, another horse you may be able to do a millimeter at a time and you have to have to work towards it. But in general, you know, the, the principles, um, you know, with the with the broken back access and the low heel, you know, I think a general principle, first thing I would look is how much toe does the horse have? Because I feel like in a lot of those horses, just simply pulling back the toe makes, makes a big difference. Uh, good, good point. I have one good one that came in and I, I really wanted to save this and kind of throw it out to both of you to see what your feelings are. Um, someone asked about your thoughts on different products, both like pharmaceutical and, and non-pharmaceutical, like, uh, you know, the supplements, uh, Adequan, Legend, Summit, which I had actually never heard of. So can either of you decide who wants to go first, but tag that one? Yeah, I mean, I think the easy answer to it is it's, it's tough for us to make any comment. The ones that have gone through FDA approval and become a prescription item have been tested and shown to do what they're stating that they can do. The other products, nutraceuticals being a common one, can say can cure cancer. And it's, it's not under FDA approved. They can do whatever they want with it, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's doing what you think it's doing. Um, you can't prove it. I can't disprove it. There are plenty of my clients and, and products that I even recommend that are off, I shouldn't say off label, but are non-prescription items. But it really comes down to what your risk is. And if you think it's worth spending the money, it may be doing nothing. That's, that's the challenge with it. Right. And because there's no FDA approval on these, there's also, you don't necessarily know the safety of these items that you're putting into the horse. So you know, if we're prescribing one of these items or recommending it, um, we're obviously trying to use pharmacies that we would trust that do a good job. But, you know, we've all, all heard of those cases where things went dramatically wrong, um, you know, and, and everybody involved in those cases, you know, we're really at, at fault for using, you know, non-FDA products. So, you know, I, for the most part, I would say I highly recommend the use of the FDA products um, and really try to stay away from, from the other products, uh, you know, just, just because I think that, that um, like Dr. Pagaro said, you know, we really know what those ones are going to do, but they are more expensive. <laughs> I'm going to throw it over to Jen. I know she's been hardworking at... Uh looking for questions. So do you see any? I, I have two. Go ahead and Jen. unmute too, please, Jen. And maybe this has already been, I've been, I've been busy trying to transfer things over and make sure that I check, check things off as we answer them. So if I miss something here, but I did see a lot of questions and I did see that Dr. Vergaro addressed this with a couple people in the chat, but I see it's, it's come up a bunch of different places um, talking about what the industry is doing to get more students Great. In, in entering and staying longer in equine veterinary medicine and, and what the, what the, you know, it, is on that. It, and the easy answer is it's a big challenge. And um, I don't see vet schools getting cheaper. Um, I, I, I think somebody even made a comment uh, in there was talking about, are we going to start using PAs and nurse practitioners um, to try to help defer some of that cost? And, and that is a good thought. The challenge with that is in small animals, uh, technicians and veterinary assistants, uh, there are some pretty strict guidelines. Like one of the things on uh, doing uh, dentals in small animals, they're allowed to do certain things, but not allowed to do others like extractions of teeth. They're not allowed to do technically that's a, a veterinarian. And typ typically a veterinarian has to be present when there's a technician around. Um, so it, it poses a bit of a challenge. Well, I should rephrase that for certain things. Um, so it, it, it would be a bit, a bit of a problem 
to have a nurse practitioner go out and do all that, but they have not really gone too far into it. Although I know some of the things that they've discussed about is shortening up some of the uh, veterinary protocol and limiting instead of doing both small and large animal, just doing one uh, specialty or even shortening up the curriculum, which I, I don't particularly like. I'm a bit old carmudgeon with the whole thing, but it may be the way we have to evolve. Thank you. Um, you know, and seeing as we're talking about veterinary school and that topic, there was a question, you know, uh, in the chat that I found interesting um, asking about, do they teach you any sales, marketing and business uh -huh. management? vet school. Yeah, it's funny. We have three vet students in the audience right now, but um, interesting. Some schools are actually, and I'm, I'm a little biased here, uh, Penn actually has a, uh, a, a, let's see, I'm sorry. It's a dual degree. It's a VMD with a master's in business, uh, but they don't teach us a marketing they will teach you some business aspects. And, and a lot of it is designed for you to understand how to run a business very lightly, but more importantly, how to protect your rights as an employee um, and so that you ask for the appropriate pay so that you can afford what you can do. And, and that's the challenge that we're having right now. And people are saying, well, what is the industry doing? Well, what we're doing is we're educating the students that they can't afford to live off of, I mean, the starting salaries for equine veterinarians, and I haven't looked at it for a couple of years now, but I would say back three, four years ago, it still was in the 40s and 50,000. Now, anybody who lives in New Jersey knows that's not, uh, that can be rather difficult uh, to do that. And that's a, a veterinarian with almost $200,000 in, in debt, student debt. Good point. I'm going to switch topics a little bit if you guys don't mind. There was a question came in about um, fitness. So, so let's talk about horse fitness because I like this topic area too. Mm -hmm. Um, for an unfit horse living at altitude, like 6,000 feet, is there an increased training time needed or should it be the same as, as a sea level horse um, that is adapted to altitude? So what, are you, what is your feeling on Who's that? Who's living at 6,000 feet? We do <laughs> have some Colorado. I, I, oh, actually, yeah. <laughs> I actually know, yeah, there was uh, some, some Colorado people there, so. You know, I'm not sure that I know the answer to that so well. Um, you have to, I mean, that horse technically should be better adapted at, at you know, it, it's blood cells at, at oxygen. And um, I think if the horse has lived in that place all of its life, then I think that the principles would remain relatively same. I think if you're moving that horse from one place to another, then you'd have to take that into consideration for sure. But uh, the way they're adapted, I don't think it's really much difference in, in how you would you would train that horse. So, you know, actually it's funny. I want to interject here. Um, we had a, a lot on this and I don't want to say how many years ago, but there during my PhD, I took a cardiovascular uh, exercise physiology class and it talked, we had several units about uh, altitude and athletes training at altitude. And um, I apologize for not remembering everything I learned in grad school. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I think, I mean, they talk about a lot of, um, you know, Olympic athletes that actually go up to the training centers, you know, in, in you know, even Colorado Springs, which is, uh, you know, 5,000 feet um, training, and then they go compete at sea level, and they're actually at a better advantage than those um, that aren't. So, um, sorry, we don't have a, a more exact question, but, but that was a good one. Another question that we had kind of in that riding and fitness and training vein um, was something very basic, but I, I think it's worth commenting on here. How cold uh, is too cold or how hot is too hot for your horse to ride? Dr. McCreel? Well, I guess generally here we deal with the, in New Jersey, we deal with the too hot problem and there are formulas um, to, to figure that out. I think it's... I, uh, I will just chime in here, Dr. McCrow. We have an awful lot of people who registered from the great state of Minnesota. So that's probably possibly why we're getting uh, questions about the cold. I am from Canada. So you think I would know that one too, but I think Minnesota gets colder than where I was from Canada. Um, I'm not you know, sure the answer to too cold. I mean, I think um, the horses do you know, pretty well in, in too cold. I, I get more concerned about too hot. You know, I think they can overheat and have, have troubles. Um, you know, horses have, have such an ability 
uh, to warm the air as it comes into their lungs. And, um, you know, really, I, I guess I just don't, I don't feel that there is, is too cold to train in. I guess if it's that cold, you probably don't want to be at it either. Um, and you won't be out doing it, but the too hot can be a problem. So, uh, you know, things like Jersey fresh, um, you know, may of course doesn't get that hot, but some of the, the trials that we have in the middle of the summer in July and August, when these horses are, are, you know, running at, 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 you know, fairly high, um, level of activity. Um, you know, there have been days where you take into account the humidity and what the actual temperature is. Um, you know, and if it's, I think it's the cutoff they use at, at the horse park, I think is 104, if I'm not right um, on that one, is the point at which they, they call it. So, um, you know, if you're doing a trail ride in 104, it's probably fine, but, but higher end of that activity is, is probably looking at potentially some, some damage to your horse and, and to yourself. And I'm sure it depends on what they're adapted to as well, wouldn't it? That's I mean, true. A horse in Florida can probably continue to work at much higher temperatures than a horse in Minnesota. Um, yes. You know, I, I, I know that it probably really d depends on that. And, and, and Arizona, I know we have some from Arizona that have logged on today. So, um, so what about, um, let's go back to the hoof since, you know, like you said, no hoof, no horse. And I know we're running over time guys, but I, I'm, I'm trying to allow for the fact that we didn't start until late. So I'm trying to get in all the questions we can, but, um, what about hoof moisturizers or supplements? Can those help with hoof cracks or, or brushes? I don't even exactly know what brushes is, but, um, can either of you uh, comment on those? Sure. I mean, everybody wants a supplement to fix everything, right? As is alluded to. I do think um, that there are some basic hoof supplements that, that uh, may help and they usually include biotin in them. Um, and there's some other things that they, they put in there too. Um, you know, those are, those are anecdotal uh, findings, but it's, you know, similar, similar supplements that people would take for their fingernails and the hair as well. Um, so uh, I do want to, you know, fairly regularly uh, recommend a, a biotin or a hoof supplement um, to help the horses grow their feet and which, you know, which one you choose. I think each, each veterinarian or fairy would have a, a different choice of the one they, they like. Um, so, you know, I would, I would ask whoever you're comfortable doing that. In terms of the conditioners, uh, that's an even harder one, you know. I don't put them on my horses and maybe that's because I'm too busy, but I, you know, I'm not a huge believer and, you know, the day's dry. So which one do you put on that day when the day is wet, which one do you put on that day? And, you know, it's going to start raining halfway through the day. So which one do you put on, you know, at that point? Um, you know, I guess I'm, I'm less inclined to recommend those. I would say maybe hoof hardeners for a horse with a soft foot. So the, the Caratex, um, or, you know, some of the more uh, basic ones, Venice turpentine, which we used to use to help harden up your horse's feet, I, I do, I do recommend. Um, I guess the oils and the conditioners, I'm, I'm less likely. I think a lot of times the cracks and the poor feet come maybe from nutrition. I think you should look at the, the whole horse body. Um, try to find out, is there some underlying disease condition in that horse? Um, you know, because the, the hooves are obviously growing out from, from the, you know, from the horse producing them, um, you know, is the trimming adequate? So, I mean, a big reason a horse is going to have cracks in their feet is because the trimming protocol is not, is not correct. The horse has toes that are too long. Um, and so I think that sometimes instead of just having a, uh, conditioner that's going to make all the problems go away, you have to look at the bigger picture. Mike, do you have anything to add on that one? Or no, I, I think in terms of the hoof supplements, I, I completely agree with what Lindsay said. I, every time I've had a horse where all of a sudden we've noticed a, a burst of growth and then I've thought it was a particular product, next time I put that product with another horse, it, it never does the same thing. So um, I think it's just fortunate when you see it. And in terms of the topicals and specifically the conditioners on things, I guess my only attitude, if it's going to allow a client to spend the time picking the feet and cleaning them, 
um, then I'm all for them doing something. I don't know that it's doing anything, but I do think there's a, there's a, a certain amount of maintenance needs to happen to these feet. Uh, the health of the frog and the solar surface of the foot really is predicated on, especially in domestic uh, situations of barns, uh, is really predicated on, on what we do. And, and I saw that all the time at the college um, when we had the horses. If they stayed with mud and muck in there, we would lose those frogs quite quickly. Yeah, and there was a question that literally just came in about Caratex being used to help prevent mud and muck with horses standing. It, it, it's fine, but you still got to pick out the feet. You got to spend the time cleaning. You got to get rid of the necrotic frog. And that's a challenge in talking with the farriers. Um, sometimes they're willing to do it. Sometimes they're not willing to do it. But if you leave, you know, chunks of frog that are just kind of hanging on there, those are all areas just for crevices and, and debris and bacteria to get down into. I'm going to tell all my farriers that Lindsay does not, if they have cracks, it's their fault. So I'm going to tell them, Lindsay, <laughs> to tell them that. So I know we're running over time. And like I said, I want to try to get, we've got so many questions. I know we're not going to be able to answer all of them. Um, but just in ending, I have one more I want to uh, answer. And then hopefully uh, Jen can um, tackle one more as well. But um, this is a good one again, because I own thoroughbreds. So, you know, I hear this all the time, but uh, someone recently saw an article that a majority of thoroughbreds have kissing spine. How do you take this into account during a pre-purchase exam, um, given that some might look worse than others and some might have issue clinical issues while others don't? Yes, that's a hard one. So um, th there have been some studies that show that x-rays do not correlate with pain and clinical signs um, of these horses with kissing spines. It is true, a lot, of, a lot of the racehorses do come with them and a lot of thoroughbreds do have back pain, right? Um, and maybe a little bit more sensitive reactive to it when you palpate their backs, they just tend to be a little more sensitive in general, right? So it's hard sometimes to tell, is that horse just reactive to me or is it actually painful? Um, on a pre-purchase examination, uh, that's where it gets more difficult because um, when you're examining the horse in terms of a sound evaluation, um, you know, you can offer some, some treatments and um, I guess if you're, if you're wrong in the diagnosis, treating it and see if the horse got better was not necessarily a wrong thing. But um, on a pre-purchase, they're making this purchase and so I think I would err on the side of caution and give them the, the risks. Again, it's not, it's never a pass fail, right? As I said, it's a risk assessment. So if a horse has kissing spines, it is going to be more likely to have pain or clinical signs associated with the kissing spines than if they, they don't show it on the x-ray. But I also say to these people, it doesn't guarantee that the horse, you know, will be uh, unrideable in five years and, or will need to have surgery to have the the kissing spine is removed. I think if you have x-ray findings and you have back pain on palpation, then you obviously have to be more worried or if the horse is demonstrating some sort of, um, you know, which is why I like to see pre-purchases ridden um, to be able to see their behavior. You know, there's some behaviors that would be, uh, you know, indicating that they may have some some pain there. But but it is very true. There is, is um, somewhat, we're not 100% sure how x-rays correlate with clinical signs at this point my attitude on kissing spine is unless you block them like if you see a sign I, i'm i'm not sure that it means a lot i mean it doesn't mean that there was an inflammation here i just don't know that it's clinical on the pre-purchase it's the toughest toughest spot yeah. to be in right jen do you see one more we'll end with one more question or um, back to Dr. McCreel, there was a question in from one of the attendees in the chat uh, about bell boots and if there are any studies um, on the bell boots that you can share or, or any you know, scientific documentation with regard to, to usage of bell boots. Meaning what the best choice of, but I'm not sure that I understand. I'm sure that's what they were referring, they were referring to is, is are there studies to refer to on the bell boot that you can share? I don't know that I have a brand, you know, but what I will recommend, uh, one of the biggest faults that I see with bell boots are the bell boots that are hanging up around the coronary band um, that are really there only for decoration then. Um, so the bell boot needs to fit properly in order for it to 
work. So a bell boot is there to protect the horse from, uh, for the most part, pulling a shoe off. Sometimes they're there to protect the horse from hitting, hitting itself, its heel bulbs. But um, you need to make sure that when that bell boot is on the horse, that the, at least the back, the back of the bell boot needs to be touching the ground. It needs to be covering the shoe um, or else the horse is gonna be just as likely to pull a shoe off as if you have no bell boots there as well. So um, to me, that is the, the biggest thing on bell boots. I don't have a particular brand or, or study that says one works better than the other. Oh, great. Uh, there is some um, clarification coming in on that from the chat okay. <laughs> fact, while you were giving that, uh, giving your answer. And it was about the single bell boot to help. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I don't have that right here. I can certainly, certainly get it. It was actually a very recent um, thing that sort of popped up when I was just doing some reading that I, you know, I read the study about and I thought, oh, that's perfect for my presentation for a little, a little tip. Um, so certainly I can get that for whoever it is that's asking. That's not a problem. Oh, it looks like somebody did already. Excellent. Oh, yep. Yeah. There you go. Look at that. <laughs> wow, that was Thank you, Gabriel. So uh, let's, I will, I will uh, copy that and send it to everybody else. So yeah, there we go. That was, that was a really fast link. <laughs> So uh, I want to just wind down by thanking all of our presenters again, so we can all give them the, the virtual round of applause or raise your hands and, and, and thank them. I think those are great, loaded with a lot of fantastic information.